Hello, this is Reza from Radicad, uh, and in this video, I want to talk about one of the most um, important uh, performance tuning options you can apply on a Power BI semantic model, uh, which is using aggregations. Aggregations can be helpful if, uh, if you have a lot of data, if your Power BI measure performance is not good, if you are using direct query, if you are using composite model, if you are using import data, all of those options, or direct lake. Aggregations is helpful in all of those. Uh, so let's go and check it out how this works. Uh, so um, aggregation is a big, big subject. Uh, first explaining how it works and then uh, step by step going through doing it one by one. So this video would be uh, specifically on the whole process. And I explained the steps, but we wouldn't go into the details of each step. Uh, then in subsequent videos, I'll explain those steps one by one. Uh, so we'll go through building aggregation tables and then managing the aggregations. All of those configurations, you'll see that on, uh, on the next videos. But this video would give you a good overall view. Uh, so let me share my uh, slides here so that we can have a look. So switching to, to the slides. Um, okay, so uh, as you can see, um, um, in this model, let's have a look at this uh, sample model. I have uh, some dimension tables uh, and a fact table. This is not a fully a star schema design, but let's um, not worry about that part at the moment. Uh, let's consider that this fact tables data is, uh, is too big, like we have billions of rows of data that if you want to build a solution like this, you either need to use direct query for the fact table and import for other tables, which would build like a composite model, or you may need to, um, you may need to import the fact table, but it would uh, consume a lot of space, which in that case, still, when you are importing a table so big, uh, performance might not be the best. So uh, in my example, in my scenario, I'm considering fact table to be direct query and I'm building a composite model combination of that. Uh, but the same thing can be also applied using import data. I actually have another video using aggregation in fully import data um, experiment that you can go and check it out later. So in this model, um, let's say this is a direct query model, let's say it is slow, this um, direct query, because every time you look at the visualization, it will generate a SQL script and sends that SQL script to the data source, the result comes back, this process is slow. And in one Power BI report, you don't have one uh, visual, you have a combination of visuals. So it would probably create a heavy SQL script or multiple SQL scripts sending to the data source, the result comes back because this process is so slow. Um, um, there are some advantages uh, in Power BI, one of them being aggregation, which you can apply to make the performance better. As I said, it's not about direct query, you can do exactly the same thing using import data. Uh, some parts of it would be a slightly different, but uh, the, the pattern remains the same. So let's say in this report, uh, one of the charts in this report, if I want to look at one chart, this particular chart in this report, if you want to query this data, you don't need every single transaction in that fact table, which might be billions of records to build a chart like this. All you need to build a chart like this is a table with two columns, one being year, the other one being um, sales, the sales amount, and then five rows because we have five years of data. So it's basically like 10 values, 10 uh, integer values it would be really a small, uh, like each integer value, like four bytes, so 10 would be 40 bytes. It's not even one kilobyte of data, really a small amount of data. So the idea of aggregation comes from this, it, that if you want only this information, so why not creating an aggregated table for that? Uh, and because that table is so small, um, import that into Power BI, which would be really a small table. When the Power BI, when the visualization needs the data, it would use that aggregated table as a source, not the original table. If that data cannot be fetched from that aggregation table, then it would go to the original table. So, so the idea for this kind of situation in this scenario would be like this, that we would have our fact table direct query and dimensions related to that direct query. We would have a aggregated version of that, which is this 
green table you see and uh, sales ag which is fully imported and some dimensions connection to that depending on how, what is the level of aggregation and those dimensions would use dual relationship uh, uh, dual storage mode which i'll talk about those as well and if you are using import uh, mod mode for all of these then uh, they would be all imported but the imported sales ag would be much smaller querying data from that would be much much faster uh, so if you want to build a solution like this, now this aggregation can come in different layers as well, uh, which I'll talk about that in a second. But let me show you this as an example in here. So this Power BI solution that you are seeing right now is actually that same solution. So you have, uh, you see that I have all of these tables and my fact internet sales table is actually a direct query table as you can see here. Let me enable zooming so that um, you can see it better in the video. So, yep, zoom in. Uh, so as you can see, when I zoom in on this table, the storage mode for this is direct query. Now, uh, this means that any query I do from this table should query data from the direct query source, which is a slow data source. Um, and I have actually a uh, SQL Server profiler here, which is a way that I can monitor any queries sent to the data source. So what I'm going to do is I would run this um, and I'm going to monitor if there is any query sent to the data source. So let's clear this for now. If I go to this uh, report, if I create a new page and from the sales, which is a direct query table, if I start dragging and dropping sales amount, into the report page, just as a simple visualization. And uh, then when I go to my SQL profiler, there is no query sent to the data source. Uh, even though that is a SQL um, server direct query source, still you see that no query sent. So how this is possible? Uh, so behind the scene, this is what you see in the report view, uh, which is like these tables. You don't see my aggregation table in here, but if I go to the model view, in the model view, you can see that I do have an aggregated table. So here it is the aggregated table. You see it is hidden. This table that is hidden is an aggregated version of the sales table. So if I go to the data view, just to show you what the data looks like in the sales table. So fact internet sales, if I look at that, um, that's a direct query, so it doesn't show me the data of that, but the sales ag, it's a um, 50,000 records table. It is aggregated by order date key, customer key, product subcategory key, and then we have some of sales and some of unit price and all of that. Uh, when you create that aggregated table, then the next step is, as I said, I'm talking about the steps, but actually details of how to do it, we'll do that in a separate video because it's a lot of details around it. Uh, the aggregated table has to mention that what level of aggregation it is doing. So this table is actually saying that there is a group by operation on customer key, order date key, and product subcategory key. Um, and then what are the aggregations, like some count of the records or some of the sales and, and this setup. So this setup basically is telling to Power BI that this table that we have created is an aggregated version of the fact internet sales. And when you set that, Power BI automatically hide this table. In the past, it didn't, so you had to uh, do that yourself. But now when you do that setup, it automatically hide that table. And that means that when you go and create a visualization from your actual big table behind the scene, it is using that aggregated table. Uh, and it would not really query that data from that original table unless the level of detail that you need requires that uh, actual detailed table, which brings us to the multi-layer setup. I'll explain about that as well. So let's say, for example, I have a visualization like this, which can be answered by an aggregation. So it would be answered by that, but then I might have another visualization which may not be able to answer by the first one. I can have another aggregation in this case. So you can have multiple aggregated tables. You can have as many as aggregated table you want. And then this would be answered by that aggregated table. And then if you ever get to a situation that one of the visualization cannot be queried from the aggregation table, it would be queries from queries from the main table, which would be the big table. Um, and that is the only place that you would do 
um, that query from the actual transaction table. That is the whole idea about aggregation, which would increase the performance significantly. So I do have actually another aggregation that I would show you. So I, as I said, I'm going to show you this like as a very overall view. So as you saw, this didn't generate any SQL script sent to the data source. But if I go and, for example, uh, slice and dice this by customer education, this still should not send any query to the data source because a uh, customer key was also one of the aggregated table properties. You see there is nothing sent to, the, uh, to that source. But if I go and uh, slice and dice this by something which was not in that aggregation, for example, in this case, something like the promotion, and let's say I'll bring English promotion name as a legend or something in this visual. And as soon as I do that, you see this becomes a slower because now it is hitting the direct query source. If I go and look at my SQL profiler, you see it generates all sorts of SQL codes behind the scene that it sends to the data source using the combination of the, uh, of the fields that it's needed. But similar to this, I have another Power BI file, which if I close this one, let me close that. And if I open the other one, and I'm going to show you uh, in detail in subsequent videos of how to do this uh, step, step by step, even the multiple layers of that. So if I go and bring this one, for example, and making sure that I would close that existing Power BI file. Now in this one, I do have two aggregated table. I have one aggregated table, which is aggregated at the level of customer key, order date key, and, um, and, and product key. Uh, which was the one that I had before, but the second one would be at the level of customer key, order date key, for product key, and promotion key. So even if I slice and dice by promotion, in this case, that would uh, hit the aggregation, the second aggregation, uh, not the first aggregation. Um, but still, that aggregated table would be much smaller version of the actual um, table that we have, which might be billions of rows. Um, so let me see if this, Power BI file is opening, um, nothing I see yet. I'm just opening it one more time. Not this folder, here it is. Okay, opening it one more time, I would clear whatever we have in this um, SQL uh, profiler um, and then we would query that again. By the way, um, Talking about the aggregation, this aggregation setup can be generated anywhere. That aggregated table, you can build it in DAX as a calculated table. You can build it in Power Query as a table and then load it in Power BI. Um, if you are using SQL, you can use SQL views or things like that. If you are using Microsoft Fabric, I would suggest to build this in your lake house or warehouse as an actual table. Um, you can do that by uh, Dataflow or you can do that by um, uh, by data pipeline, by SQL scripts, by any of those means, and then save it as a table because then you would have the direct lake uh, functionality when it comes as a table. And then finally, you would be able to, to build um, that aggregation on the top of it. So this file is almost opening uh, and we are going to have a quick look at how this performed with that file. Still opening. Okay, the file has opened and um, in this case we have two aggregated table. I'll just go to the model view so that you can see the two tables and uh, the two aggregated tables. One is uh, first layer, the second one is a second layer. So here you can see these are my two aggregated tables. Uh, the second one is the one that we've added. And when you have multiple aggregated tables, you have a precedence that you have that you would set up in the manage aggregation. So here, for example, in the manage aggregation for this one, precedence is zero, but for the other table is one, meaning that that would be the um, that would be the first one to try. So here, if I go and create a new page with a new visualization, let me first show you that. Um, I'll clear this so that there is no query running yet. So here it is. So now I'm going to um, 
I'm going to create a visualization. So from that direct query fact internet sales table, I'll go and get the sales amount. This should not hit the direct query source. It would be um, the, mm, the aggregated table. As I come here, you see nothing is hit that. Um, if I slice and dice this by something like education, I'm still hitting the first aggregated table. So this should not also create another SQL query. You see there is no SQL query generated. But then if I slice and dice this by something like promotion, which in the first example that I showed you that uh, sent the query to the data source, in this case, this is a uh, query from the second aggregated table. So this should not also send query the data source, as you see. And then like if I go to the third layer, which I don't have in this case, like for example, slicing and dicing this by something like, um, like order sales order number or something like that. Yep, sales order line number. If I want to bring that as a legend instead of this, then this should send query to the data source. And as you see, the queries are sent to the data source. So, um, so in overall, uh, in in overall, the aggregation is a process that when you enable it on your Power BI semantic model, no matter if you are using direct query, composite model, import data, uh, when you are dealing with large amount of data, this would uh, help because your aggregated tables would be much smaller tables. And then you would um, switch or uh, either Power BI automatically switch to aggregated tables first uh, in the order of precedence that you set up and then hit the big table at the end if you are not, if you don't have any aggregation for that, which would be a still a lot better in terms of performance. You would get only to that stage when things are uh, when things are um, filtered down to a specific area of the detail. Uh, or if you are doing Power BI import data with aggregation, you will create some measures that based on uh, some of the conditions, it would switch to aggregations, which is the video that I already have. Uh, about each of these steps, creating the aggregated table, setting up the precedence, setting up the manage aggregation, and testing it, building it across multiple layers, I will create separate videos and you can go and watch those videos later. I hope you like this video and if you like this video, go ahead and subscribe into our YouTube channel. We have weekly videos on Power BI and Microsoft Family. Until the next video, bye.